Well, welcome Kevin and uh, really looking forward to this. This is a, a new role for you yes. and uh, quite a lot to do uh, in digital and in government. Yeah. Um, I'd like to start off with your earlier career uh, because you've come quite a way from mm -hmm. Liverpool and uh, other points up north. Um, and really, uh, that's that was quite an interesting MSc in artificial intelligence. Um, what do you see as the the role of artificial intelligence in, in government? And is is uh, Kurzweil right about the singularity? Uh, so, I guess. Ooh. So my bachelor's degree from Liverpool is actually in computer science. It's my mm. master's here in London that's mm. about AI. Um, I've always had a reasonably purist view of artificial intelligence around the Turing test, that AI is only genuine AI if it can uh, convince a human being that it's not a machine but is actually cognizant. Uh, and in many ways, what I see as the current incarnation of AI today, which is largely machine learning based around neural nets, probably doesn't have passed my strict definition of AI. Mm, so mm. part of the reason why I spent 10 years working in the AI industry and then stopped was because I felt this was fundamentally hard and if I wasn't careful, I'd spend my entire career doing AI, mm, which mm. at this point would be true, mm. without making much material progress in genuine Turing test style artificial intelligence right. rather than what we have right. today, which is largely machine learning based mm. on neural nets and some other um, advances in processing power for chess and go. Mm. So, mm. so I don't personally see that we'll make many profound changes in AI in general over the course of the rest of my lifetime, and certainly probably not in government. So good file, not right. No, <laughs> I, I think we'll have enough difficulty producing AI in a box. Mm. Mm. without necessarily trying to convince people that it's all part of a, mm. a singularity. Mm. Yeah. Do I see that there are applications of AI in government? N no, not really. I think they're profoundly hard. I do think, though, we will see applications of machine learning in government. Yep. So um, areas like fraud detection would be... Already there, isn't it? Yeah. ...susceptible mm. to machine learning. Mm. Uh, and there'll be other areas as well, no doubt. Mm. I think, you know, probably the thing I think we've underexploited in government and we will make more of between now and 2025 is things like wearable devices. Mm -hmm. I don't think we've really contemplated their use enough, biometric use enough for identity, for healthcare, mm. for regular monitoring of people with disability to understand what their needs will be. So that's probably the bigger area, I'd say, biometrics and wearable devices. Health as well, obviously a big area. Yes. And it's noticeable that uh, IBM are putting a lot into uh, use of Watson in, uh, in health and healthcare, especially cancer. Yeah. So uh, that's probably where we're going to see. And accountants, accountants are using. <laughs> yeah, and there's quite a big study on at the moment with Moorfields Eye Hospital. Oh. Where I forget the number, but it's something of the order of 250,000 people have allowed their data to be used for, for Moorfields Eye Hospital to try and do deep data mining to understand what eye conditions they could predict ahead of what they can do today. So right. there are these kind of examples already within the fringes of government and health. So then you moved into <coughs> PwC as a I did. consultant. Good, good experience? Uh, yeah, I did uh, the best part of a decade with PwC mm. on their kind of graduate program, all in AI, expert mm. systems. Oh, right. And uh, uh, people believe me when I say this nowadays, mm. but in 1992, I wrote PwC's Global Methodology for Agile, which people in government tend to think, since they discovered Agile in around 2010, it's a new <laughs> thing. And they point out actually a decade earlier, mm. or 20 years nearly earlier, some of us are already thinking this was sufficiently well understood that we should write it down so that other people could use it. So a good springboard into your next uh, into your next roles, and uh, that seemed to be very much around um, mobile and mobile technology. Uh, <coughs> um, so a good grounding for now. Mm. Yeah, I think um, from PwC, I actually joined Goldman Sachs. Spent oh, a lot of time yes, with yes, Goldman in New York. I mean, oddly enough, writing trading systems, which was what I used to do, mm. is quite like AI. You, you speak to experts, you understand what they're trying to mm. achieve, and you try and encapsulate that in a computer program. Mm. So uh, I did, again, broadly decade with Goldman, and then went to work for T-Mobile 
in the days before really mobile data mm. but but like the the people I joined in a company called T-Motion we believe the future of data was mobile not on a not on a computer which when you think this is the year 2000 mm. it's quite innovative and yes, at the time yes. the very first phones were beginning to have portals in black mm. and white mm. a long way from the kind of functionality we had today but but that was my personal view the big Nokia 3310s and that sort of stuff yeah exactly the <laughs> banana phone yeah I remember my first car phone yeah <laughs> um, so then in what what made you move into government because that was DWP wasn't it it was 2013 so yeah. uh, I think it's an open secret I liked uh, the permanent secretary's chap called Robert Devereux now mm -hmm. Sir Robert Devereux uh, and Robert was struggling with a problem called universal credit oh, yes. which we'd looked at and had um, built a number of test cases around but actually there was a real opportunity to do this um, to solve this problem differently using agile and using um, in-sourced, in-house um, development skills and that's kind of what became my mission help the Department of Work and Pensions in-source uh, development capability look at universal credit for a different lens which we now call Agile mm -hmm. and take it from there and it was both the fact I really liked Robert I thought he was a very decent guy trying to do a very decent hard job as well as the size of the challenge of universal credit that brought me in. So the issue with the universal credit um, where Agile helped was that that was the front office activity, was it? Yeah, um, so um, mm. universal credit is today a mix of Agile development of the front end services mm -hmm. and some mm -hmm. other services, coupled with a largely waterfall development of existing and replacement of legacy. The legacy. Mm. Mm. And that's pretty much the way all big transformation programs work. They have a degree of flexibility test and learn around the front end, mm. as well as some proper engineering that goes on behind the scenes that is largely operated to a waterfall plan. So from DWP into um, quite a different department. GDS, yeah, I've always... Um, so my big roles at Goldman Sachs and Vodafone were all group roles, so in the centre. Mm -hmm. So I, I believe I have a whole raft of expertise around how to corral in this case 26 departments mm -hmm. into a common set of objectives so um, DWP was kind of a little bit of an aside from that privately I think a lot of people recognize I'd always wanted to come back mm -hmm. towards the center role mm -hmm. and help all departments across government and uh, luckily that came back together in September last so do you year. see the role more as evangelist or um, herding cats uh, the typical CIO. I mean, uh, is it a sort of CDO, CIO role that, that you see this as? I, well, I'd see it as largely one of creating a vision and strategy, mm -hmm. uh, which we've now done and we've published, and talk about that if you like in a minute. Sure. <coughs> as well as then putting the organisation behind that. And, and in government's case, I would say absolutely all the departments want to come on this journey of transformation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because they recognise that this is how we meet some of our financial targets for the, for the coming years, as well as actually meet the citizens expectation that they want to deal with us as digital by default. So I, I don't personally feel it's herding cats. I feel as though I'm <laughs> corralling a set of the willing mm, mm. to come on a journey. And it's my job to explain how that journey could work and bring people with me. So is the digital appropriate now or is it, because uh, I noticed that um, moving into the that, uh, transformation strategy that you've um, just published, in fact, you've said that it's much more around transformation than it is digital. Yeah. I, I think I'm quoting you there. Um, <laughs> you probably are. I think we've been very clear to say, if you, if you go back through the GDS strategies and particularly to 2012, mm -hmm. which was digital by default. Mm -hmm the creation of 25 exemplar services. We've actually done that really very well, mm. both in GDS and in departments. Uh, and the analysis shows that by 2020, there will be more than 100 different customer-facing, citizen-facing digital applications from renewing your passport, renewing your driving license, claiming universal benefit, checking your state pension, booking a doctor's appointment, paying money to prisoners, you can even apply for a fishing license and should you want to you'd be able to apply for a divorce online as well <laughs> so pretty much the entire waterfront of the citizen facing expectation of government will be digital i think that's central government isn't it it is you're talking yeah. about that yeah, yeah. Much more so. yeah. <coughs> and what we've recognized 
in the 2017 transformation strategy, and we deliberately called it transformation, not digital, was that actually we now need to go beyond that. So by the time we get to 2020, departments will have become as efficient as they can using digital services mm -hmm. and citizen facing. But the real benefits will be in joining up the data that departments hold that's useful to each other uh, as we go forward. So and it's true to say that there have been impediments around sharing data in the past. I, I have felt that personally myself in, yeah, in government projects. There has, um, until, mm. until about now, mm -hmm. uh, the only way you could legally share uh, data between departments, so let's say HMRC wants to share something with DWP, is through legislation. Mm -hmm. And it's been fairly onerous getting that legislation through Parliament. The Digital Economy Bill, which is now going through its final readings in the House of Lords, essentially says thou shalt be able to share data across departments, but the big proviso is that you have to write down the specific use case mm -hmm. each time you do this in mm -hmm. a code of conduct. Mm -hmm that it equally is inspected by Parliament for proprietary uh, purposes. So, so we've got a framework now at least for having an overarching framework of legislation that we can, we can all agree and a code of conduct that can evolve as public confidence in the way we use data also evolves. Um, building on the, the successes of the uh, obviously that 2012 strategy that you've just published, yep. um, so it's just very uh, fortuitous to yes. be talking at this time um, and congratulations it really looks like quite a fantastic piece of work um, what what do you see now as, as the major challenges uh, coming up uh, in terms of the, the strategy and what you want to accomplish in there I mean you've, you've published a lot you've said a lot but it'd be quite nice just to, for you to give us a, an overview of that I think yeah and in my own words but I tend to do this in five areas. Mm -hmm. One is, we've said very publicly, we will continue use, making use of the 2012-2015 strategies mm -hmm. around digital by default, government's a platform, that work still is going on, I suspect right out to 2020 and probably a little bit beyond. Uh, but the four areas we've chosen to emphasise as being new areas within the 2017 strategy are, one, we need to get better at transformation, mm -hmm. not just Business digital service design, yeah, yeah. but complete end-to-end transformation of a business like Universal Credit is doing for the benefit system mm -hmm. or like the courts and tribunal service are doing and bringing um, reform to the justice system. So one is transformation, two is we're still light on capability in the civil service. So although we've said we'll insource capability, we still don't have enough good digital data and technology professionals today. What about the transformation? capability. So uh, transformation it's is... Slightly different, isn't it, from it, the digital? It, it, mm. it is, yeah. So transformation builds on top of digital and data. And in digital data, we've got a whole set of academy programs. We're training 3,000 people a year in digital data. And so technology. that's an interesting transfer you're taking from DWP, in fact, isn't it, that digital academy? Yeah. It is, yeah. yeah. All eight of them, in fact. <laughs> so uh, all eight will now belong to GDS and we'll, do, we'll provide that service for all departments, not just DWP. In transformation, we've built an external advisory panel because we don't typically have transformation expertise in government. Mm. These guys help us look at the programs at inception and, and on a continuous basis to give us the best chance of landing these transformations. And again, we've got a couple of things that are allied to that. One is we've created a week-long program called Orchestrating Major Programs, which we teach at Oxford University to our more senior permanent secretaries and DGs around what is the difference between what we've been doing mm, and mm. genuine transformation. And the second thing we've done is create a methodology which we call the seven lenses, which is a unique way of looking at a transformation and giving yourself a view of whether you're in good shape or mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. So maturity, capability, uh, yeah. vision, plan, and, capability, yep. leadership. Yeah. Okay. So, right. Um, and 2020 is not that far away. <laughs> no, 2020 <laughs> is less than a thousand working days. <laughs> so quite an ambitious program for... for yeah, them. well, 17, mm. 2017 is really all about setting us up for beyond 2020 in truth. Mm -hmm. Now, we are doing some of these large transformations like universal credit and courts reform, making tax digital verify today. But, but the intent is to be in good shape when we get to 2020. And we've largely finished the 2012, 2015 strategies so that we can move forward. As say, the four key new elements are transformation, 
capability, the mass build out of civil service capability, data which we've underinvested. That's in. important, yeah. isn't it? Yes, uh, I do. I do feel that that's something which <coughs> comes across much more clearly in this new strategy, and it's certainly one of my great issues. I think is data and information. After all, chief information officer is uh, the yeah. answer is in the name, really. Yes, isn't yes. It? <laughs> and, and we've said we tend to forget that. Well, we said very clearly there are three things we want to achieve in data. One is better use of operational data between departments. Mm -hmm. uh, two is we want to publish more open data than we have. We've actually published 30,000 data sets online, but we think even that number is a low estimate of what we want to achieve. Uh, and then the third thing is we want to use data mining and data scientists better to create better services in the first place. Mm, it's going to be quite a competition for those sort of people, though. Yes, yeah. but that, that's true of digital and technology as well. Mm. And part of the reason why we built these academies that are capable of training 3,000 people a year is because we can't go to the market and get mm. these people. Yeah. Mm. We want to grow our own and, and potentially you know, re-skill um, re some of the people we have with us today. And, and is retention going to be an issue then? Uh, it mm. hasn't been to date. Mm. I mean, people that join the civil service tend to do so for a set of reasons mm. associated mm. with mm. doing good in society and being part of a broader civil service. Absolutely. So yeah. It hasn't been to date. Right. Impact on other areas and, and so what, what, um, what uh, exchange do you have with other areas such as local government, health, and there's a whole range of other services, aren't there? Mm. Yeah, I think there's, um, there's probably two or three things in here, which is one is our engagement with the largely federated organisations, mm. health and local authorities have mm. been an example of that hasn't been as strong as it has been with central government to date, although we are looking at that going forward. Equally, we are now really assessing what we're doing in terms of GDS's national footprint, where we're based. Today we're based only in London. London, yes. And, and, and that yeah. doesn't yeah. seem to be the right answer. Yeah. The other thing we're really seriously assessing is our international presence. So um, the UK today is the leading e-government in the world, according to the UN. Mm -hmm. We would like to remain as the leading e-government in the UN. So we're putting in place a set of programs that understand how we can learn from other countries, but equally how we can contribute to other countries as well as part of our broader international program now in GDS. Yes, it's, it's interesting to see the Americans seem to have followed our, it our is. lead, isn't Pretty it? Pretty much all the major countries seem to have followed our lead. America, mm. Mm. Uh, Australia, New Zealand. Yeah, it's quite yeah. interesting. Yeah, okay. Interesting. Um, quite a quite a strong point in in the strategy about the the need to move away, I think, from the large, uh, long IT contracts uh, of the past. Um, easy to do, difficult to do. Uh, I think we're on track to do it. We've made considerable progress over the last five years. I mean, there was a point in time where most of our contracts were consolidated in your suppliers. If you now look at the spread of contracts that gov uh, government and departments have, it's actually uni uniformly um, projected across the whole of the UK, across hundreds of companies. Mm. So I think we've made fantastic progress with things like G Cloud, Digital Marketplace. It's just for us a continuation of that rather than anything new. Yeah, so that's maturing and, uh, and actually growing, yeah. yeah. Although the big suppliers will still be there, I suppose. <laughs> I suspect they will, yeah. <laughs> They have the resources. I um, don't know if you read that uh, um, MIT Sloan and uh, Cap Gemini r report on, but quite interesting. I thought it was quite a good report actually. It looked at 400 companies, over 400 companies across the world, and uh, looked at a set of d digital myths, mm -hmm. I think. And I think some of these really play to your, your strategy, actually. Yeah. Um, the first one of that would be very much around digital is primarily uh, primarily around customer services. Uh, yeah, could be. I think I think the myth I choose to spend most of my time busting mm -hmm. uh, is that transformation is about digital. Digital is about technology, and therefore. Transformation is all about technology. There, that's one of the second myths. Digital matters only to technology and B2C yeah. companies, that sort of thing. And I think what, what you're saying is, is no. Yeah, we try and <laughs> teach that technology changes all the time. Digital is just one of the tools you can use to affect transformation. But the most important thing 
is to begin thinking about your businesses in the 21st century and how mm -hmm. they could operate mm -hmm. very effectively and what tools we have to support that. It's quite interesting to study because it, it focused on these, these companies and it looked at uh, what it called um, digital initiatives and then uh, transformation initiatives. Yep. Um, and uh, one of the other myths that was coming across was let a thousand flowers bloom. Yeah, mm -hmm. Everything filters up from the bottom and you will, uh, you will actually build up a strong strategy. How, how do you find that in, in what you're doing? Uh, the, there's merit in that as an approach as there is to you know, having a managed portfolio looking down. So uh, we recognise really that of the projects we start, and the evidence suggests this is the case, that about 20% of the flowers that you set off blooming don't really bloom. So if, if you're prepared to accept that of your thousand flowers, a thousand, sorry, 20% of those will never bloom, that's perfectly fine as a mm. strategy, but I think you have to accept going in. Well, Kevin, many thanks indeed on a Friday afternoon, yep. and um, that was really quite interesting, and good luck with the, the strategy, you've got a lot to do, and uh, it, it's very clear now. I like to see that there's much more of that um, transformation and recognition that it's more than purely digital in there. Perfect. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much.